Good evening. To many people, art and science seem like polar opposites. One data-driven, the other driven by emotion. One trucking in the realm of the subjective, the other mandated to discover objective truth. In a letter penned at sea, returning from his trip to Japan in 1922, Einstein wrote to the poet Bansui Doi, whom he befriended, the scientific quest really is different from that of an artist. The latter will evolve with certainty if he has the ability to feel and see, the power to create, and the stamina and love of perfect creativity. Science, however, is like riddle guessing or even playing the lottery. Many a highly talented young man labors until ripe old age without the severe goddess unveiling anything of her deep secrets to him. She is unpredictable and inquires little about the merit earned from a devoted search for truth. Later in life, Einstein amended this. The experience of the mysterious he wrote is the fund found fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. Those engaged in both worlds know that the similarities between how artists and scientists work can be surprising. Both are dedicated to asking questions. What is beautiful? What is true? How can we know? What can we know and what is beyond our purview? Picasso is said to have quipped that art is a lie that helps us see the truth. And before him, Samuel Butler that science is but a measure of our ignorance of our ignorance. So both science and art search deeply, often wanderingly for answers. The cliches are of course misguided. Consider the science of mixing paint then think of imagining the strategy of a virus or the dance of a quark. Nabokov said it beautifully, the tactile delights of precise delineation, the silent paradise of the camera lucida and the precision of poetry and taxonomic description represent the artistic side of the thrill which accumulation of new knowledge gives its first begetter. There is no science without fancy and no art without facts. The Renaissance master Leonardo da Vinci is famous for developing a painting technique called sfumato or the blurring of boundaries between objects which in the hands of biographers became a metaphor for his own rejection of the separation between art and science. The talent of the author of the Mona Lisa as an engineer was exhibited for all to see in 2001 when the artist Vebjorn Sand built the Da Vinci Broen Bridge in Norway using the artist's never realized plans for a bridge meant to stretch across the Golden Horn in Istanbul. Rejected as an architectural impossibility by the Ottoman Sultan who commissioned it, the bridge was built 499 years after Da Vinci designed it, proving the Sultan wrong. While da Vinci conducted his own experiments in engineering and in medicine, other artists were keen to observe and document a rapidly evolving body of scientific knowledge. Rembrandt's painting, The Anatomy Lesson, depicts a scientist with a partially dissected corpse and throng of spectators eager to understand the workings of the human body. Among the most interesting examples of the artist as a recorder of the practice of science are the paintings of Joseph Wright of Derby, who worked at the close of the 18th century and was part of a small group uh, called the Lunatics, who were so-called because of their society, the Lunar Society, uh, which met on the night of the full moon so that their horses could show them the way home. Wright's famous painting, a philosopher giving a lecture at the orrery, depicts an intimate gathering around a mechanical model of the solar system. Documenting the growing popularity of science among the public at large, the painting records a range of reactions to this marvel, from wonder to introspection. Beyond the use of art to document scientific progress, Marianne North's paintings of tropical plants serve as both historic and scientific records. Active in the 19th century, 
North traveled extensively on her own, which was a feat unheard of at the time for a woman. Beyond traditional plant specimens, which are usually collected and dried and preserved in herbaria, her brilliantly colored paintings bring those species to life in their natural habitats as part of their ecosystems. And Charles Darwin considered North's paintings to be excellent examples of his theory of natural selection. Nearly 200 years before North, the German naturalist and illustrator Maria Sibylia Merian traveled to Suriname, returning with gorgeous drawings of the life cycle of butterflies. And these in turn played a crucial role in unraveling the mystery of metamorphosis. If artists have served as great partners in the communication of scientific research, they may also serve as great partners in the navigation of scientific mysteries. It makes perfect sense. Ideally, art and science value open-mindedness and inquisitiveness, and they do not fear the unknown. In fact, they seek it out, sometimes by leaps of imagination, sometimes by incremental steps, and often with both. And while science and art have been demarcated since Leonardo's time, practitioners on both sides have, um, are increasingly appreciating this. Recent examples include uh, collaborations between the Rhode Island School of Design and Brown University on new ways to visualize oceanic data to see the impact of climate change on marine life and on the boundary blurring works coming out of the collaboration between Stratasys 3D design printing uh, and the MIT uh, artist and scientist Neri Oxman in which art and architecture combine design, biology, uh, computing and material engineering. So in non-trivial and important ways, art and science are really partners in our journey to interpret, to study, and to explore the world around us and our own selves. Uh, here today to help us understand this partnership more deeply is my good friend, Lauren Redness, author, uh, artist, type designer, Parsons School of Design professor, recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, and all around lovely human being. Lauren's book, uh, Thunder and Lightning, Weather Past, Present and Future Weather as in the Weather, uh, won the 2006 Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. Uh, and an earlier book, Radioactive, Marie and Pierre Curie, A Tale of Love and Fallout, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Her new and exquisitely beautiful book is Oakland, A Fight for Sacred Land in the American West. As with her other works, which I really urge you to buy and take pleasure in. Um, it blends deep research and Lauren's unique art of, of printmaking, illustrating and writing to convey ideas that both challenge the mind and speaks to the heart. I met Lauren about a decade ago in Los Angeles. Uh, and I remember being mesmerized by the encounter with her book, Radioactive. I've since become a huge fan um, and tonight we'll have the opportunity to speak to Lauren about the question, can art illuminate science? So welcome everyone to Talking About Science in the 21st Century and welcome Lauren. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so, so much for that beautiful, the, your beautiful remarks. And um, I'm so delighted to be here with you with a writer and thinker who I so deeply respect. And um, yeah, so I will, um, share my screen and we can um, continue. So let's see. When you look at the screen, um, what are you seeing? It, maybe it looks blank, like um, we might be having technical difficulties or some kind of Zoom problem. Um, I just wanna put a pin in that question and return to it. As Oren suggested, um, I'll share a little bit about my work now and a few more thoughts about this interplay between science and art. Over the past few years, I've been writing books, nonfiction visual books. The books weave together long form prose narrative and artwork in different ways, depending on the subject matter. For instance, in the book, 
Oren mentioned Radioactive, which is a book about radioactivity and the reverberations of scientific discovery. I made cyanotype prints, which is a process that uses the ultraviolet rays of the sun to turn chemically coated paper a deep shade of blue. And in a book um, about weather and climate, I created copper plate etchings as a nod to early scientists and naturalists that use this printmaking technique to disseminate their observations and ideas. In the past, I've designed new typefaces for each of my books. I want each project to have its own personality, a personality that runs through the writing and reporting, through the artwork and even the design. I want the book as an object to be beautiful, even when the subject matter is difficult. My most recent book is about a land rights struggle in the American Southwest, where a proposed copper mine is poised to destroy a Native American sacred site. In this case, I wanted the artwork to reflect the reporting to feel raw and direct. So I drew on location with colored pencils. Most of the drawings are, as you can see, representational. They're portraits and landscapes. But when the book veers into the supernatural, the artwork reflects that. Oral history is a really big part of my work, whether that's tracking down the man you see here, a former United States Navy cloud physicist to talk about his role in a secret military operation to create rain in the clouds over the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the Vietnam War, or relaying the voices of multiple generations of a family to tell the story of one place over a long period of time. In short, I'm interested in fusing art and text to create some new thing, some third form that can achieve effects I don't feel I'm able to achieve with prose narrative or images alone. My interest in science and the natural world makes its way into much of my work, whether that's the physics and chemistry of the work of Marie and Pierre Curie, or meteorology in my weather book or geology in this recent book about copper mining. Oren talked about some of the cliches around science and art, um, how science and art have been positioned as opposites, science being objective and systematic, reproducible, while art is said to be subjective or you know, idiosyncratic, one of a kind. But of course, as Oren was laying out, these divisions are not so clear cut. And for one thing, we're used to learning about science in the natural world through images. Here we see the first detailed microscopy image of ultra small bacteria, evidence of tiny life forms. Um, this is from a lab at um, University of California, Berkeley. This is the 2019 image in which we glimpse the silhouette of a black hole. Here's a classic, the Edward Moybridge photo sequence that proved that a galloping horse does indeed lift all four hooves from the ground at the same time. With the rise of the printing press in the 16th century, investigators saw mechanical reproduction as an efficient way to disseminate knowledge. Drawings and etchings were a natural fit with books and other printed matter. This is Albrecht Durer's 16th century etching of a rhinoceros. It should be noted that Durer himself had actually never seen a rhinoceros in person. Illustrations made vivid new discoveries and new theories, even speculative ones. They made them instantly vivid. Apparently this image was reproduced up until the 20th century in certain science textbooks. The emphasis on firsthand direct observation would gain traction later in the century in the 17th century. 
in the early 17th century, Galileo used a telescope to produce this famous sequence of engravings of the moon. Galileo's observations, and more to the point, his depiction of those observations argued against the Aristotelian idea and church doctrine of the perfection of the heavens. Galileo showed the moon's surface to be cratered and pockmarked, emphasizing the imperfection of the cosmos. The images served as evidence to bolster the theory. When I was just out of college, I worked at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. I drew fossil turtles for a vertebrate paleontologist. The museum was just an incredible place to work. This is the button panel of the staff elevator. You could press, you know, camels or mastodons. You could go to all other mammals. And when the elevator doors opened, you'd see shelves like this or like this. The scientist I worked for would give me a specimen and I would study it under a special microscope that projected an image of that specimen onto an adjacent plane. The idea was that you could then trace that projection to create a precise two-dimensional replica. Only that really wasn't the idea. In fact, I was almost never asked to create a likeness of a specific specimen. The point was not to portray this particular creature in front of me with all its nicks and bumps, but to erase those particularities and to show a platonic ideal of that species. Each drawing I made was an enhanced and edited representation. And it was these artistic interventions that, make, that made the images scientifically useful for identification or classification or for tracking evolutionary progression. A, photo, um, a photograph couldn't have done that work. You needed a human making choices about what marks to put on paper, what marks to leave off. Drawing images like this was a kind of revelation for me. I started seeing this sort of scientific abstraction everywhere. I noticed painters working in the name of science who veered away from Beaux-Arts conventions of scale, of perspective, of color and light, because they needed to convey certain information, for instance, about the anatomy of an animal or the structure of a plant. And that emphasis produced a kind of proto-surrealism, you could almost say, sort of avant-garde by accident. This is um, one of my favorite images along these lines. It's a 1725 watercolor of a flamingo by the British naturalist, Mark Catesby. Again, this image doesn't show us an individual real bird. It depicts the idea of a flamingo. The artist emphasizes details that give us information about the animal's physiology and eating habits. You can see each articulated thread of the lamellae along the beak which indicates the way that a uh, flamingo can filter algae and tiny crustaceans from gulps of water. But to be clear, this is a really weird picture. The head is hovering midair, it's disembodied, it's enormous, it's psychedelic. The imperative to convey specific information pushed the artist to make decisions that resulted in a highly eccentric image. And I tend to think that this strangeness is crucial to the impact of the work as a piece of art. Good art is something that surprises, even startles us. It's new and thrilling, almost you could say, like a scientific discovery. I'll show you this one other example along these lines. This image from 1801 is an engraving of a flower known as a shooting star. The artist is Peter Charles Henderson. I love how Henderson managed to make this flower look both monumental and menacing. You see the leaves unfurling like tentacles. There are dark storm clouds looming in the distance. The only evidence of human presence are the two tiny ships, which are minuscule compared to the size of this flower. This is a botanical painting it conveys morphological information about the species, 
but it also feels like it could be the poster for an Alfred Hitchcock film. It's a very creepy painting of a flower. I think Catesby's Flamingo and Henderson's Flower capture a certain feeling, a sensation of strangeness, wonder, terror that we experience in the presence of nature. There's an emotional truth conveyed here, which coexists with the image's scientific and utilitarian value. I wanted to borrow from this tradition when I made the artwork for Thunder and Lightning, which was published in 2015. Um, as I mentioned, my um, choice was to make copper plate etchings as an homage to these examples that I just showed you. The book looks at um, various weather phenomena. For example, the way wind has affected the course of history, how the jet stream and trade winds factored into transatlantic voyages, how local winds sunk ships and decided the fate of nations, how a wind's change in direction can turn a mile wide wildfire into a 50 mile wide fire with catastrophic implications. Some of history's most renowned scientists have used drawing in their work. When he was a child, um, Charles Darwin apparently attended lectures by the celebrated ornithologist and painter John J. Audubon. Historian Julia Voss has written about Darwin's drawings. She believes Darwin used drawings not only to represent, but also to consider and investigate. Voss has written that Darwin, quote, thought through his eyes. You can see on this sketch from 1837, Darwin wrote the words, I think, above his diagram. The phrase seems to have a double meaning here. The diagram is a completion of the sentence, as if Darwin is saying, I think that the process of evolution might work like this. But the words also seem to caption the image as if the drawing is the thinking itself. The act of drawing is part of how Darwin puzzled things out. When Darwin drew, he wasn't trying to make art. When in 1895, William Ronchen made the first medical X-ray, this famous image of his wife's hand, he didn't have artistic aspirations either. But X-rays like Darwin's diagram of evolutionary processes did something that both artists and artist scientists do, make the invisible visible, make evident a truth that can't be seen on the surface of things. As a visual artist, at a certain point, I got interested in making a visual book about invisible things. My 2010 book, Radioactive, is about Marie and Pierre Curie, their romantic lives and their scientific work. The book explores two kinds of invisible forces, radioactivity and love. The narrative in Radioactive doesn't proceed chronologically. It shifts back and forth between historical and more recent events. And I use the cyanotype prints to create a slightly dreamlike quality for the narrative that's both a love story and a tragedy. The images are made by UV light, invisible rays to suggest radioactive exposure and also what Marie Curie described as radium's spontaneous luminosity. So we've been looking at images that inform, tell stories, images that make us feel, but images can also misinform, distort, play tricks on our emotions. That flamingo painting I showed you earlier was part of a huge artistic and scientific undertaking. Over two decades in the 18th century, Mark Caseby documented hundreds of birds, reptiles, fish, plants, mammals in North America. At first glance, the project seems to be a virtuous and important contribution to scientific knowledge, but there is also um, a dark side. Casey was supported by the British government. He received funding from the Royal Society. 
and in identifying and representing the rich flora and fauna of North America, Catesby participated in incentivizing colonial exploitation of indigenous lands and resources. Obviously, we can't blame British imperialism on Mark Catesby, but we can recognize that these paintings aren't neutral historical objects. My latest book is about a highly contentious situation that's still unfolding. Oak Flat is a high elevation mesa in southeastern Arizona that's considered to be sacred by the Apache, the indigenous people who have long inhabited this area. Oak Flat used to be an Apache burial ground and today it continues to be the site of religious ceremonies. And as it turns out, under Oak Flat lies North America's largest known untapped copper deposit. The copper here is said to be worth approximately $160 billion. Politicians and corporations are eager to access the copper ore and reap these profits. Mining at Oak Flat would cause the ground surface to collapse. So once the copper has been removed, Oak Flat would disappear into this void. My book is about two families with ties to the land, an Apache family who is fighting to stop the mine and a mining family from the nearest local town. During my research, I wondered, what is copper anyway? Where does it come from? How does it end up on earth? Copper, as it turns out, is produced in dying stars and flung out into space as these stars explode. A dying star collapses in on itself and spews clouds of hot gas. That intense heat and pressure forges elements like uranium, silver, gold, and copper. As a star explodes, it expels these elements into space and in these dense molecular clouds, new stars and planets form. In other words, the copper at Oak Flat is older than planet Earth itself. It was made from starlight billions and billions of years ago. A mine here would operate for about 40 years. I have a point of view in each of my books, but I try to avoid moralizing. I'm interested in gray areas. If the book creates an unsettled feeling in my readers, I consider that a good thing. In Thunder and Lightning, I have a chapter about fog. I wanted to generate a sense of disorientation in the reader, a feeling of being lost in the fog. And in this section, I obscured all visible landmarks. You just see these vague, amoebic shadows, but you're not maybe entirely sure that you see them. And this goes on for page after page after page after page. So you begin to wonder if your eyes are playing tricks on you. Once you establish that you're using a rich tapestry of words and images to tell a story, and then you remove the words or you remove the images, you create a kind of void. And I think that void can have its own sort of power. There's another chapter in Thunder and Lightning that plays on this idea. It's about two thirds of the way through the book, a chapter called Sky. It's a kind of cloud atlas, completely wordless. And it's in that chapter that you encounter this page. You may recognize it. It's the blue spread I showed you at the start of this talk. There's nothing here to orient us in the image. No landscape, no buildings, no figures, no horizon line. My hope was that by this point in the book, readers would experience a page with no words as narrative and a page with no images as representational. What we're looking at is not a malfunctioning Zoom call, 
it's an everyday scene that is both banal and sublime. It's a metaphor and an encounter with infinity, but it's also just an observed depiction of what might be the world's most familiar sight. You could say it's both science and art, or maybe it's neither. It's just a clear blue sky. Thank you. Wow, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, beautiful art that you brought and uh, produced by others and, and your own art. Um, I'm trying to think where to begin. Um, and uh, radioactive, which I have behind me. I love the book so much that it's, it's just, it's in my office sort of almost like you put in a bookstore. Um, and radioactive starts um, with an apology. I don't know if, if, if everyone can see this, but it says, um, with apologies to Marie Curie, who said there is no connection between my scientific work and the facts of private life. And I wanted to start there and to ask you, why did you feel like you needed to start with that apology? What were you trying to say? <laughs> this brings me back. I have to try to remember. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I wanted to address it head on, you know, because she had said that. Um, and there was a point at which her, um, she was about to be awarded a second Nobel Prize. And right at that moment, the news break broke about a scandalous marital, a scandalous affair she was having with the scientist Paul Langevin, who it happened was married. So, you know, whatever year this was, 1911, this is a big scandal. His wife got involved. She had hired someone to steal their love letters from the apartment where they were meeting up and um, they were published. And so this was an international scandal. Um, and the Swedish um, Nobel Committee called her up or I guess, you know, wrote her a letter <laughs> and said, no, actually we need you to dis decline this Nobel Prize because it's gonna be a mess. We can't take the scandal. And so that's when she said, the facts of my private life have nothing to do with my scientific work. And she actually wrote to Einstein and he supported her. Of course, he was busy with all of, you know, what he had going on, but, um, um, inter, you know, extracurricularly, but, um, and he said, you know, he said, I, you know, I fully support you. And, um, and so she went on and she did, she went, she traveled to Sweden, she accepted her second Nobel prize, of course, making her not only the first woman to have won a Nobel prize, but now the first person to have won two Nobel prizes. And um, so, um, and I think she was making an important point, which is, um, you know, maybe in a certain way, self-evident, right? That her scientific work is not diminished by the fact, you know, by whatever, is going on in her romantic life. These discoveries are unchanged by, by any, any kind of personal details. But at the same time, what I was saying was she is one person. She is, to tell her story, you need to tell all of that because to talk about scientific discovery and to separate it from ethics or the ramifications, the, you know, reverberations of those discoveries and how they play out in our lives, whether, you know, what, um, you know, nuclear war, nuclear, you know, nuclear weaponry, nuclear medicine, nuclear power, all of these things are part of the legacy of those discoveries. And we have to grapple with them all. We can't, we can't kind of compartmentalize them. Right. Right. And, and he, he, even sort of more deeply that there's, there's a deep connection between biography and science, because there has to be, it, it couldn't be otherwise. Right. And, I, right. and I remember like when I was, um, I wrote a book about, about the evolution of altruism and, and sort of the, the, um, the, the, the biography that allowed me to address the larger problem, which had been a problem going back to Darwin, because how do you explain the evolution of the trait that reduces fitness if evolution is a game of survival of the fittest. This was a great paradox. Um, and, and there was something about 
the scientific problem that I was very interested in getting down to the, the heart of. And that was like, you know, how can we ever know if an act of kindness isn't just a form of disguised self-interest or something like that? And that exists as a scientific question. It exists both for humans and in, and in nature. And there was something about the biography of, of the man who wrote the equation that helps to explain the dynamic which really um, was kind of an exemplar of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the problematic. And yeah. so I wonder if you search out in particular to find like human instances that allow you to explicate a scientific problem um, mm -hmm. because humans understand, can understand through story and through especially biography, such a, such a strong tool they can get at a problem uh, perhaps more easily uh, if you help them do that. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I think, right, I guess, I think maybe that's, I mean, what I, one of the things I love in your work is how you do weave together, you know, there, are, you know, you explode all categories and genres and, and weave these different practices together, um, which I, I imagine feels very natural to you. Is that is that true? It 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 does feel very natural. And we were speaking a few days ago, and you said too that like all these divisions between like you know when I hear someone say as an historian or you know <laughs> as a you know molecular geneticist, it, it it always feels strange to me to hear that because sure you have to um, acquire tools and skills. And that takes a lot of time and dedication um, and you can do that in discipline. So it's not, you know, it's not to say that they are not important, but you know, where the mind roams seems like, you know, it, it, very strange to co compartmentalize. Um, what, what I, you know, what I envy um, is that I, I, I don't have the, you know, I, 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 I can't use art uh, in, in a visual sense in the same way that you do, which is such a powerful tool over and above what the word can do. Um, it's funny, it's a, it's a funny problem because sometimes I feel like, is it or is it a crutch? I ask myself, you know, I mean- Why a crutch? Why would it be a crutch? I don't, yeah, no, I mean, I guess, I guess because I'm all like each each project is like a search for the right balance, and it's never immediately obvious what that balance should be. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess some things seem best expressed in an image. I mean, to draw a portrait of someone, there's an immediacy there where you can look that person right in the eyes, and it's like I think. Um, I mean, the the beauty of of not doing that and using words is that then the reader is contributing their imagination, right? So it's sort of like what, how much of the readers are, of imagination are you asking for and how much are you handing them or, you know, I don't know. It's just finding, finding that right kind of balance. But, it, but I mean, surely with, with art, you can also invite imagination. Like you can, as you do so beautifully, like you were showing that fog, you don't know what's happening in the heads of your readers, but you, you could just imagine. And I'm sure that each one of them is in a different world. Like even though there's, you know, the, the, they're looking at the same page, um, there's something about your art which, in, it, which invites a kind of plurality in, in, in your readers. Um, so I think that it's, you know, just as you can, you can do that with, 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 with art as you can with words. Uh, it's just a different medium. Right, right. No, it's so true. And it's like, and you can use the format of a book. So um, to, to also like be your assistant in that, because it, the one really great um, kind of effect that art can have is pacing. It can really kind of um, affect the way a reader leaves through a book or the speed at which a certain section is processed. And I think like, if you eliminate words from a section, it's like, it, I, yeah, I think it, it requires a kind of different engagement, a different type of engagement. And I guess I hope a different, it, um, 
it then imprints on the memory in a different way, right? You have that kind of visual that is like simple and almost stands in for the text in the content of whatever is being addressed in that section. I, do you know that book? It's one of my favorite books um, about science, um, even though it's, okay, it's called Einstein's Dreams by, by Alan Lightman, you know that little, little book? Oh, yeah, yeah, I haven't read it, but I, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. You definitely need to read it. It's a tiny little book, it's beautiful. You can hold it in hand, it's, it's almost like for kids. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it goes through uh, different reveries or dreams that Einstein is having during his Anis Mirabilis in 1905. And in each one of them, he imagines a different way in which time uh, works. So sometimes time is circular, sometimes it's punctuated, sometimes, you know. Um, and, I, and, and, um, and, I, and I had the opportunity to have a discussion with Alan Lightman and he said, and I said, this is such a beautiful book about science. In fact, it's my favorite book about science or one of my favorites. And he's like, yeah, but it's, but it's, not, about sci it's not about science at all because not one of the stories, except for one, sorry, there are, ma there are many reveries, but only one describes an actual time in this world. All the rest are fancy. Right. They're, 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 totally, they're total fancy. And what he was saying was something really interesting, which, I've, which has gone with me and I constantly like grapple with it. He said that um, when he writes about science, he has to separate entirely between fiction um, and nonfiction. Um, and if he wants the, the writing to have a, a, a kind of literary power to it, um, that when he's, then when he's writing about science, he needs the science to be fictional. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because then when you start writing about it, because if you make it real, then it, it devolves into you know, being didactic or you know, it creates a kind of, um, um, I guess it was, you can call it like a, like a um, you know, a, a, a um, what would you call it? What would you call it? Um, just like limits that you have to work within. Yeah. That constrain your imagination. So, what do you think about that? Oh, I love limits. I'm all about limits and constraints. I mean, I feel like those are the greatest opportunities, and to find. And I like when I. And I'm not a trained scientist, so for me, it's always a heavy, heavy lift to learn what I'm talking about, which I try to make an advantage because I think like, for instance, when I was researching the Curie book, um, I would very often read about their work and it would come to the point where I was supposed to feel this great sense of you know, elation about their discovery, but I wouldn't have understood any of the explanation. So I couldn't experience that, like the impact of that moment in a genuine way. Like I didn't, I was like, okay, now I know something important happened, but it wasn't like oh, that actual excitement, like when you're watching a movie and something truly really happens. And so I wanted to understand the science to be able to communicate that, to hopefully can allow, you know, to be able to write it well enough and simply enough that a reader would experience with that. And, um, and so what I did was I would, you know, do all my research and then I would write it and then I would share what I'd written with a historian of science, Dan Kevlis. And, um, and then Dan would give me like notes, like, oh, well this, you know, he, and then he would say it in his kind of very, you know, um, scientific and um, yeah. kind of more formal way. And so that was like, okay, I hear you. Now I'm gonna, you know, make these edits. And then, but I need to find a third path that accomplishes that, that makes it correct, but remains poetic. You know, and so it's like, because I was always looking for the kind of multiple layers of meaning. And so I absolutely wanted to get it correct, but I didn't want to sacrifice the poetry. Right, right. And it's also kind of interesting the way science, the way artists often look for a, for a constraint. Like in, in a sense, you can't escape from constraints because whatever, whatever material you're working with is a constraint, you know, um, and then, you know, and, and then, even more directly, like, you know, Picasso in the blue period, why was he just, you know, why was it just blue? That was a constraint that allowed for some kind of, you know, imagination to come out. Yeah. And I think it was Rachmaninoff who said the technique 
is the scaffold upon which the, the greatest, the, the highest spirit climbs. Right. So technique being a, being a constraint too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with you about that. Um, about, about constraints are so generative. Absolutely right. You can transcend your own habits and your own kind of limitations because you have no choice, right? You have to find some new path. And is that one reason you think that you gravitate, not in all your work, but, but you, you do gravitate towards science? Yeah, I mean, I, I just find it endlessly fascinating, I think. And it's like, I'm just kind of interested in, I mean, it's just like fun for me. It's like, I know I want the process to be, um, you know, um, something that I care about and something that I feel like I'm learning. Yeah, so. Um, I was thinking, and I was thinking about this, like that idea of like process and like what it is about, because we're talking about like drawn images or photographic images in science. And I was thinking about um, why, you know, why drawing still in this world where we have like such incredible, to the other thing I, that you made me think about was tools, like what, how technology and tools have, you know, through the course of time have affected the relationship of art and science and what each kind of camp is capable of of creating and um, or seeing. And, um, and I was just thinking about like, when you do a drawing, you have to slow down, right? You have to take all this time to, you know, a, um, a tool like a camera, you can instantly capture, not, you don't have to, right? There's long exposure, there's, you know, various ways that a photograph can take longer than an instant, but, um, but a drawing is inherently something that takes more time. And I think in that process of creating a handmade image, you have the, you, you kind of create the possibility of understanding something better, right? Because you're searching and you're searching throughout that whole process. Right. Um, I just wanna pause for a second and invite all, uh, all of our listeners to send in questions. Uh, we'd love to take them. And I, and I wanna, um, here I have Oak Flat here. Um, and you showed, <laughs> I told you I'm a fan. <laughs> um, you showed in, in your presentation, the, uh, the, sort of the opening, the opening scenes of the book, which are really, really beautiful. Um, and, and the way the, 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 the book starts is um, kind of telegraphing the story to focus it, um, you know, starting in outer space and then and then telegraphing it, it to focus it on the deposit um, at Oak Flat, and I and I'm wondering. I think this is related to what we're talking about. If you if you could talk a little bit about how you move from sort of the cosmic to the deeply personal, because that's true also of radioactive, um, and and why you seem to gravitate to stories that allow that combination. I think it's really interesting. There's something like very cosmic almost absolute, you know, like radioactivity or, you know, materials that come from outer space. And then you find this beautiful way of, of, of connecting them to very, very personal stories of human beings. Yeah, I, I think outer space is like this secret character in all of my books somehow. Like, I don't know, like it keeps showing up and they almost all end in outer space. But, um, but yeah, I think, I mean, it's one way of kind of um, demonstrating the stakes, right? Or it's both the connections between things and also, um, I guess two, two images and works of art come to, or, you know, art, artifacts of history come to mind. One is that powers of 10 piece by Charles and Ray Ames, right? And they have it, in both directions, right? The, there's the one direction where it starts on the um, the tiny picnic blanket, and each time multiplying out until so you're see, you start out it's a very intimate scene of I think it's a couple on a picnic blanket, and boom, 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 powers of ten out, out until you're in vast outer space, and it's just like just this sense of scale and the sense of you know both um, you know how both the interconnectedness of things, but also how um, our individual lives are dwarfed by time and space. And, um, and also that I guess that iconic picture, right, that was taken from outer space, looking back at earth. And, um, and yeah, I guess, it, I mean, in, in Oak Flat, it was, it was a pretty explicit decision to like, 
how can I convey why this particular situation is um, of consequence to someone who doesn't live in Arizona, who might not, you know, like think about these particular issues or, you know, and it's, so it's a kind of a way of, of bringing it out and um, bringing it to a larger, you know, making, making the frame a little bigger. I think, I think it also has to do with sort of the, the when you juxtapose the, the peculiarities and the frailties of, of human lives, of personal human lives, mm -hmm. with sort of the, the vastness of what's out there, um, whether it's in, you know, tiny, minute workings within a cell or outer space, there's something about that meeting that it, that's, that's really, uh, it's beautiful, it, 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 it touches the heart because there's something so incredible about us tiny human beings, you know, so passionate about understanding the world around us and, and trying to uncover the secrets of nature. Um, well, it's, I mean, I think, you know, you talked earlier about leaps of imagination and the known and the unknown. And I think about that kind of shifting line between the un and the un unknown in science. Go, you know, if you go back, say, to Durer and this period where um, people were, you know, just um, say Europeans were imagined or had heard about horses with black and white stripes and mermaids and like, there was like what's real and what's not real and it had yet to kind of been um, clearly um, decided or understood. And then moving into like um, the early, like 19th century where you have the X-ray being um, discovered radioactivity and all of these invisible forces. And you also simultaneously conversations about um, communicating with the dead and levitation. And so again, you have, you know, you have Nobel Prize witnesses, Nobel Prize winners going to seances. And so that like it, that was being navigated. And now I think there's a lot of talk, right? So much talk recently about UFOs. And it's like, it's like, what's um, what will we know in a hundred years or in 50 years now, like where that line between superstition and science and the supernatural, how will what will be understood now then? Yeah. It's, do, do you have any thoughts about like training, like the training of, uh, of scientists, whether, whether art should be part of their training? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Um, I mean, I feel like the best scientists are incredibly imaginative, right? Um, and I mean, what artists can do for scientists is help visualize those projections, right? Um, sort of help us imagine what is possible. So I think probably, probably wouldn't hurt to introduce the idea of, um, you know, like, yeah, those tools of the imagination for a scientist. I don't know exactly what form that would take, <laughs> but sure. Yeah. Um... And, and when you think about your own, your own development, like, do, do you feel, what, what did you study in, uh, at college? Like, what, what was your major? Um, I studied art and French, basically because one of my friends told me that the prettiest place to graduate was the garden of the French house. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess that's a good enough reason. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I, you know, I declared my major as an art student um, before school even began, I knew that was something I was going to pursue. And, and how did you get to the American Museum of Natural History, which is, I, it, that is a dream job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I spent some time there and, and also in sort of the, 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 uh, the elevators that are for the staff, which is, is a, like a different universe from what <laughs> you know, is, a, is like this secret universe that's happening inside there. It's really one of the most wondrous places in the world. Oh, it's such a dream. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, um, how did I get there? So I think I always thought I would be like painter, just a fine artist. I never really considered anything else. And then when I got out of school, I was really bored doing that. I felt really isolated and like I wasn't really learning that much. So, um, so I, then I started, um, so I decided I would get a PhD in botany because, you know, I just imagined the, the, 
the field work and the trips. So then I was taking like organic chemistry and, um, and, um, and it sort of like through that kind of led me to working at a plant research lab. And um, while there, they asked me to draw the mutant specimens that we were growing, these little um, mustard seeds. And as I was drawing, I was like, oh, I'm just so much happier drawing. Like I'm not meant to be in a literally sterile environment. And, um, but that sort of circuitous path brought me to um, combining art and science, uh, you know, scientific illustration at the museum. Wow. Um, we, we have about five more minutes. Uh, it isn't a lot of time, but I, I'd like to spend some of it um, asking you about your, your next project. Where are oh. you going? <laughs> um, well, as I mentioned to you, I just finished a children's book, which is a first for me. Um, although maybe it seems obvious that someone who makes picture books for adults would make picture books for children. Um, so yeah, I just did that. And um, I have a few other ideas and I'm going on sabbatical. So I actually have the time to indulge kind of um, speculative projects. So I have some, I did a public art project just before the pandemic um, up at Lincoln Center in New York City for New York City Ballet. and that gave me a lot of ideas about public art. So I'm thinking I have um, some research projects, but also like some maybe other public art type ideas. What was the children's book about? Tell our audience. Yeah, the children's book is about time capsules. It's, um, I had started doing research about time capsules thinking I would write an article and it morphed into a children's book. So there's a the children's book is just about one child just makes a time capsule. And then there's a long afterward that kind of crams in all my research that was gonna be something else. <laughs> there's some outer space in there. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I guess there's, there's, there's this article by, um, it was an essay actually that Virginia Woolf wrote um, um, that was called um, The Art of Biography. Uh -huh. and, um, and she argues there that nonfiction is a kind of, is, is a form of, of craft, whereas, whereas fiction is a, is a, is a, is a, a form of art. Uh -huh. um, and this was actually kind of a, like a jibe at, at Light, Light and Strakey who had been writing biographies of English queens and so forth. But the essence of the argument was that, that again, the reality of historical facts um, produces these kinds of constraints, which to some degree um, limit the scope of imagination in, in ways that don't, don't pertain to, to pure fiction writing. And this is, we started the conversation talking about this, but I, I wonder whether you feel like that you were talking about gray areas, whether there's a, where's a, there's, a, where there's a point or a gray area in which like the demarcation between fiction and nonfiction sort of be becomes um, nonsensical almost. Um, and whether that, because when I read your books, I like, there's a very, there's a strong narrative, there's a, but then there's something magical that for me doesn't exist either in fiction or nonfiction. It's like, it's like in its own place. Thank you. Um, oh, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I mean, I think maybe the key thing is being transparent about the material and where the material is coming from. And part of why I think drawing is valuable is because it's transparent in that way, right? It asserts its own subjectivity when you know it's a drawn image um, rather than a photograph, which is full of subjectivity and editing and choices, right? But it's less obvious. Um, and I do think there is an important distinction between fiction and nonfiction in just the claims that it makes. But, um, but I think that, um, there's as many choices and personal kind of quirks that go into nonfiction, um, absolutely. And I mean, so many fiction writers, right, use the real world as the basis for their work. So, yeah. So if we're talking about uh, choices, uh, uh, a listener by the name of Casper 
says that he'd love to hear about the process of selection uh, for the works that you that you produce. Uh, and in particular, what questions do you ask when you begin a new project? And do you find certain topics better for interdisciplinary work? Um, I think for me, the biggest consideration is, um, is there enough kind of complexity that I don't know at the beginning what the result will be? I think if I could picture it, completely what it will be, that is not an interesting process. I wanna set out to be surprised, to allow for serendipity and yeah, to create something that I couldn't have imagined at the beginning. How about you? Um, like for me, I feel like um, it has to be a, a, a personal journey for me. In other words, it has to be a type of question that I'm actually, that I, I don't know the answer to and then, in fact, usually the most interesting questions to me are also questions that don't actually have an answer. And so they, so they invite like endless roamings and like, you know, one moment you're here and then the next you're like, no, I believe that. And um, so for me, it has to. So and that was the case uh, with altruism. And then it was the case with uh, my last book, which um, which which was sort of it was called Ev Evolutions. And it was about the great. Um, the great evolutions uh, from from the uh, uh, Big Bang, the creation of the solar system and the, and the moon earth relationship. And then once life uh, started on planet earth, the great sort of um, evolutions in life. So from, you know, multicellularity and sex and sight and, and flight and, and uh, consciousness and language. And, um, and to me, uh, the reason why I, I embarked on, on the project was because these are, these are sort of like grand narrative tales that have always been addressed by world mythologies. And I was really interested in the, in the relationship between the language of myth on the one hand and then the language of science, which um, appeals to these same self questions, but through different methods. And I want I mean, we think of them sort of like art and science is extremely distinct. But in fact, when you look closer, you see that, you know, there are, much, there are many more similarities. And, I, and, and that was almost like an existential question for me, really. Like I, I, um, and, and now I'm working on this book about metamorphosis, and it has to do with, you know, uh, the human preoccupation with um, what is transformation, what is change. And it came just as, my, as, my, as I was about to become a father for the third time. So again, very, very personal. For me, it's, it's very personal, but there has to be like at the heart of it, there has to be a scientific question, which is like, you know, has a lot of meat. Yeah. Well, what I loved about what you did at Evolutions was the way you put us in the cosmos, like right, this world that can be completely disorienting and alien and you made it so intimate, right? Is there's an I in the you, the sun in the moon. It's like this intimate conversation that you let us into would, in this world that, is so awe-inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's what can I say? We're 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 all very fortunate to be you know to be able to, rather than dealing with war and violence, to you know think about the the, the beauty of art and the beauty of science and and the relationships uh, the relationships between the two of them. Um, it's been such a pleasure um, having you as as my guest and seeing you and talking to you. Um, I hope we get to see it, see each other in person before too long. Okay. And uh, I just want to thank you uh, in the name of all of our uh, listeners for a wonderful presentation and hour together. Thank you so much, Oren, and thank you to the Van Leer. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you. Bye-bye.